Good evening. We have sound. It's good to have you with us here this evening and for our uh, midweek service. We are using the propers assigned for the three-year series, which is from the Gospel of Matthew, which we've been studying on our daily prayer. So um, some of this will be a little familiar to you, and, uh, but you'll hear how it's all tied together with an Old Testament psalm and epistle. Let's begin then with our service, Divine Service Setting 1, page 151. We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are uninjured, sinful, and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have not done, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence in eternal punishment. For the sake Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 7. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord, your God, is God, the faithful God, who keeps his testament and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We know that for those who love God, 
all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, and then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, and he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure when it is new and what is old. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O
For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Your God has chosen you to be his people. This is the Reformation doctrine. Well, I'd say it was before the Reformation, but it had been obscured. But it was restored in the Reformation, the doctrine of election. Election. God elected you. He chose you. You noticed all the verbs of choosing that Moses used in Deuteronomy. He has chosen you. The Lord set his love on you. He loves you. He keeps his oath. He brought you out. He redeemed you. Therefore, no. He is God. Faithful God who keeps his testament, his promise. So you see that when it comes to the doctrine of election, God choosing you, it's entirely about his work for you. Which means it's about the gospel, a gift. Do good, O Lord, to your chosen people, we said in the psalm. So you hear, heard St. Paul also in Romans confess the doctrine of election. It's really the chief text that can be used to demonstrate the doctrine. But notice again, all the verbs belong to God. He predestined, he foreknew, or excuse me, in order, he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, and he glorified you. So elect, to election belongs everything that belongs to salvation. That God chose you means he has saved you. Have you understood these things? As he asked the disciples, the answer should be yes. But there is a problem with our heart. Our heart can't understand what you might call the economy of salvation. That everything belongs to God and given to us then as a gift. Not belonging to us except by way of his giving. Because that's not the way the world works. The world we rightly call the left-hand kingdom and the church where the gospel is preached is called the right-hand kingdom. That's another Reformation emphasis. And so Jesus gave us parables about the kingdom of heaven, the right-hand kingdom. That should be your clue right away that what he's talking about is parables of gospel. But that's not how we hear the parables. Because he says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Comparisons belong to the law, this or that. So when we read the parables, we don't read them in terms of gospel gift, but we hear them in terms of, well, who am I? How do I fit into this parable? But, of course, because Jesus is preaching the gospel to us, the law still has to do its work, too, to kill us in order to make us alive, to elect us to salvation. And so the parable actually gets in the way of our sinful hearts, and exposes them for what they are. And so, for example, I mean, three very short parables, right? The first was, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, that would be a worker according to Mark, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So there's a treasure, but it's been hidden in the field. And then, of all people, this man finds it, and then through, well, no doubt some deceit, buys the field, doesn't pay the full price, sells everything he has, which isn't much because he's a worker in the field, buys the field, not probably telling the owner what it is. That's how you would read the parable if it were a parable of the law. But that's not how Jesus would have us read this parable or the others. What he's actually teaching is about your election, that he has called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified you into the Christian church. This is about the doctrine of the church. But with all doctrine, 
there is both warning and consolation. And so the kingdom of heaven, the church, is not like the kingdom of this world. So it's set in contrast. So when we heard the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, well, that, that part sounds good to us. But then the way that the man behaves doesn't make any sense according to natural estimation. What you would normally do if you found the treasure is take it. Maybe if you were a little bit more honest, you would report it to the authorities. Maybe it was something valuable and try to find the original owner. Maybe it's a historic artifact and it actually belongs in a museum or something like that. But here's this man doing the most deceitful thing, buying the field so that he can gain the treasure. So, if we're going to read this by way of the law, then who are you in the parable? And what is the treasure? And where is the field? Well, the field is clearly this world. And the treasure hidden in the world, well, what would that be? Well, we just sang about it, right? We sang that Jesus is our treasure. And so then that means you're the man who's working in the field, a slave or a worker under command. And then you happen to stumble upon this treasure in the field, not knowing it was there, not even really looking for it, not deserving it either, not by any righteousness of your own. Again, probably not by legal or honest means. And you weren't even prepared to find this treasure, but there it is. Well, that sounds pretty good. Except you're still a slave. You're still a worker. You're still under a master. And probably even buying that field, you're still going to be enslaved to someone having found that treasure. But maybe you should read it, again, as a parable of the kingdom, not of this world, but of the kingdom of heaven. And there, who is the treasure? I gave it away, didn't I? Who? You are the treasure that's been hidden in this world, but which a man, Jesus, has found, and for joy gave up everything that he had, suffering, even crucifixion and death on the cross, to buy, well, to redeem the world, thereby to call you. The kingdom of heaven is like Jesus finding you in this world and calling you to faith. The doctrine of election. This is precisely how divine election operates. You are effectively dead in a field as, yes, a treasure, but made a treasure by the finding of you. If no one found you, you would not be worth anything. You'd just be, well, buried in the ground. So what's really aggravating is that God hides his treasure in a place it shouldn't be, puts you in this world, and then not where you would ever expect to find it, two miles out of Random Lake or wherever he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies his church. But also, if the treasure, well, is in the field, it's buried, what can it do to be found? Nothing. Can it find the man? No, the man has to find it. And so it goes with election. God must choose you, not you choose God. So only those who do not deserve it will find it and get it. So who are you? And what does he want you to do? Well, if you're the treasure, you are the one whom God has chosen and he does everything for you, even makes you righteous, forgives you your sins, gives you his goodness and mercy and grace. All of this violates our own common sense and thereby, well, the way that most Christians even teach this parable, these kingdom of the heaven parables. They think it has to necessarily operate the same way as this world where you are the actor, you're the one doing the thing. So you're the one who goes and finds your treasure, Jesus, and then sells everything to stay with Jesus, gives up everything in this life. But instead, and maybe you might have to correct a family member or a friend on this, the gospel is telling you who he is and what he has done for you. This divine election sounds like a terrible idea because it violates our innate desire to earn favor before God, to merit, to please the angry God somehow, to find him. 
We think it's about us selling and giving up everything and making everything then about getting, finding, and holding on to Jesus. But that's not the way the church works. It's entirely out of our hands because, well, that would be by way of the law, but instead the church is entirely by way of the gospel as a gift. There's no way to find the church, to get it, to earn it. There's no way to seek after Jesus and to grab hold of him. Instead, the treasure, you are God's treasure, and he comes and finds you and elects you and chooses you. You are the treasure hidden in the field. And the man who finds you, his treasure, his beloved, is Jesus. He chooses you. He gives you all that belongs to him and thereby makes you wealthy beyond imagining, a great treasure. And not only that, we also heard in the third of the parables, the pearl of great price, of course, that's you again, but in the third with the sea and bringing in all the number of fish, that Jesus also gets rid of everything that gets in the way of you being his treasure, anything that might uh, draw you away from faith in him. And so the angels on the last day, of course, will separate you out from the just and they will be cast into the furnace of fire. So God is the one who is the seeker. So-called seeker-friendly church is a misnomer. No one seeks after God. No, not one. Romans is clear. But rather, God is the seeker and he sought you out and he has brought you here today to bestow upon you his many and rich gifts to forgive you your sins, to bring you to his altar, to receive his body and blood, and then to possess you, body, soul, and spirit. So as Moses said to the people of God, speaking on behalf of God, he is a faithful God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. He's brought you out with a mighty hand. He's redeemed you from the house of bondage because the Lord loves you and he'll never let you go. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the flock of God so often attacked by wolves who seek to mislead and devour the sheep through their false teaching, that the church would test all things against God's word and so be preserved in pure doctrine and bear the good fruit of salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all pastors, as they care for the church of God, which Christ obtained with his own blood, that they would be strengthened as faithful shepherds and overseers, especially to feed the flock with the very body and blood of Christ, so that there would be no division among God's sheep, but all would have unity in his truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the people of God, especially our churches as they meet in synod, that kept steadfast in his word, they may please the Father with their lives and teaching, bearing abundant fruit by the power of the Spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all governing authorities, that they would fear God and foster peace. For our people, that God would look favorably on them. For our youth, that they would be brought up in discipline and right knowledge of Christ recognizing both God's law and the way of salvation through him alone. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who need healing, strength, and comfort, that they would be defended from the attacks of the evil one and able to join in God's praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, your word is like fire and you fill heaven and earth. You are not far off, but you are in our midst, announcing the salvation accomplished by your living Christ, the crucified. Again, grant to our synod gathered in convention 
the Spirit to think and do always such things as are right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may be enabled by you to live according to your will. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to greet one another.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.